really, this is, uh, this is just a, a, a chat about comfort. And uh, I'll start with how I felt when I heard from the Dutch architects, uh, Alma and uh, Christian, who, from Zone Urbaine Sensible, who uh, curated the talks and events during uh, the, the couple of months of the lab here in New York, when I heard from them that the theme was supposed to be comfort. And at first I thought, this is crazy. What does comfort have to do with <laughs> urban restructuring? Um, isn't that a private kind of idea? Curiously enough, I understood comfort to be a very Dutch idea. I don't know whether this has been um, explained at any of the, the events at the lab, but in fact, the word gezellig, uh, which is Dutch for comfortable or homey, is a very prevalent part of, the, of discourse in Amsterdam, where I, quite by chance, spent last year my sabbatical year from City University. I was at the University of Amsterdam. So the word comfort immediately suggested to me that these Dutch people were bringing their Dutchness over to the Lower East Side and imposing this, you know, this Dutch concept of, of comfort on us New Yorkers for whom comfort is really a foreign expression. So uh, I started remembering what comfort, gezellig, sounds like gesellschaft to us sociologists, or it sounds like gesundheit to us Americans who are used to hearing people say uh, that when you, when you sneeze. Um, I started thinking about what gezellig means in the Netherlands. It refers to a sense of hominess, and there, there is a, uh, both an aesthetic and a social meaning to comfort in the Netherlands. And this is what I want to chat with you about today, how we get from the aesthetic meaning of comfort to the social meaning of comfort. That's what I think this lab is all about. So if you think about what Americans would call white Dutch people, because the heritage of the Netherlands is in Northern Europe, and the immigrants who came to the Netherlands for many hundreds of years came from other countries of Northern Europe, where most people whose genetic background goes way, way back into history, gives them blonde hair, brown eyes, not necessarily blue eyes, and white skin. And that historical background of the farmhouse has really been challenged since the 1970s when so many people have come to live in Northern Europe from other regions of the world. In Amsterdam, for example, the three largest ethnic minorities come from Suriname rather than the Caribbean, come from Morocco rather than, say, Mexico, and come from Turkey rather than East Asia. So uh, it's really shaken the, the Dutch and in fact, the European understanding of the, the, um, both the aesthetic visibility of comfort and the social emotions of comfort, to think that comfort includes people from vastly different regions of the world who all come together in the public spaces and sometimes even the private spaces of Dutch homes. So what do we mean when we think of comfort in New York, where we are historically an immigrant city, and we have diversity built into our DNA, our DNA as a city. Maybe there are three dimensions of comfort. There's the, the physical dimension, the, um, the public space social dimension, and then there is the, uh, the, the cultural dimension of, uh, of comfort. Let's start with the physical. How do we get comfortable in public space if we're sitting, walking, or standing in public space? This is always a contentious issue. Look at Occupy Wall Street, which is our premier case today 
this very day and in these weeks of how people can get comfortable in public space. Does anyone have a right to stand where they want in public space? What about if they stand with a sign, a protest sign in public space? What about if they walk with a sign of protest in public space? What about if they march in public space? We know about all the challenges that getting a permit from the police department poses to standing and walking in public space. And this week we know how hard it can be to sleep in public space if you're a protester. So how can you really get comfortable if you have to get permission in advance to occupy public space? If you know you're only living in public space day to day, what are the similarities between the protesters of Occupy Wall Street and the homeless people who have tried to sleep in public space at least since the early 1980s when homelessness really increased with deinstitutionalization de of mental patients, with uh, enormous increases in living costs in big cities? with joblessness due to industrial shutdowns and automation. So can we ever feel comfortable occupying public space if we're homeless, if we can't pay the rent? How can we occupy public space in a comfortable way? What about the protesters who built a tent city in Tompkins Square Park number of years ago, not so far from here, a five minute walk from here. What about the mostly male, mostly elderly uh, alcoholics and drug abusers who lived until just a few years ago in flop houses on the Bowery, just a two minute walk from here. How can people who can't pay the rent feel comfortable in public space? That leads me to the second dimension of public space. How can people who can't pay the rent be with other people who can't pay the rent in public space? If they're not allowed to sit, if they're not allowed to stand, if they're not allowed to sleep in public space. And it's not even the police alone who prevent people from coming together in public space and occupying it. It's also the public-private partnerships, the business improvement districts, the parks conservancies, whose major functions are to keep public space clean, to pay for public space, to uh, secure public space. And every business improvement district, we have more than 60 in New York City now, in rich neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods, every business improvement district is charged with keeping the peace in their shopping street, in their commercial street, and sometimes, as with Union Square Park, Bryant Park, Madison Square Park, the so-called elite parks, mostly in Manhattan, the business improvement districts are charged with keeping people away from occupying those public spaces, except under very specific conditions, conditions that make everybody feel that they can pay the rent, that they are middle class, that they can buy an ice cream, or they can buy uh, an expensive um, drink or, or hot dog, more expensive than the, uh, the mass-produced fast food that those who can't pay the rent try to, try to buy in public space. The High Line is another example of uh, the, the way public spaces are increasingly occupied only by people who obey the rules, the rules that are set by public-private partnerships that join city government agencies with private, mostly business, organizations. So how can people be with others like themselves who can't pay the rent, or others who don't have such high incomes, or others who are 
not of the, the dominant ethnic group of the city. I'm thinking now of Fulton Mall. Fulton Mall was a public space filled with stores, low prices, many owned by immigrants, a public space mainly for people of color. A lot of African Americans, Caribbean Americans, Latinos frequented Fulton Mall and felt comfortable there. Why? Because they were with people who were like them. And this reminded me of a, a contradiction in the Dutch sense of comfort, again, back to the Dutch sense of comfort, a contradiction between feeling comfortable with people who are like you and the need in cities to be with people who are not like you, because cities are the most diverse spaces on Earth. In the Netherlands, uh, each city government has a goal of social integration. That means that it is the conscious goal of city governments in the Netherlands to prevent ethnic concentrations, particularly if those ethnic concentrations have uh, uh, mostly low-income individuals and, and families in them. In other words, the Dutch government wants to prevent urban ghettos from forming. So how do they do that? Um, they use this goal of social integration to subsidize the entry of stores and residents into uh, immigrants and ethnic uh, minorities neighborhoods, the entry of people who are creative, creative producers, cultural producers. In other words, the city government, say of Amsterdam, tries to make a Williamsburg in reverse or a Lower East Side in, in reverse where it's the city government over there that puts gentrification into a neighborhood. What you say, how can this be? The city government says this is diversity. We are encouraging diversity by discouraging low-income people who are also in ethnic minorities, say Turks or Moroccans or Surinamese, to be with others like themselves. We think that's bad. And to tell you the truth, I went over there with the idea that that was not such a good idea, that they should encourage ethnic concentrations, that it was a violation of people's comfort level to prevent these ethnic concentrations from surviving. But I'm wondering whether they actually have something in, the, in mind that we talk about here when we talk about diversity. So I'm thinking, is comfort really challenged by social integration? Do people who congregate at Fulton Mall because they feel comfortable being with others like themselves, do they, should they be forced to be with others? who are not like them. That's what's happening now. During the past two years, a lot of the old businesses have been forced to close in Fulton Mall. Their leases have not been renewed. Pressure has been put on building owners. Informal pressure has been put on store owners to shut down and quietly move away. And gradually, they're being replaced by those um, anonymous chain stores, not necessarily high-priced stores, but chain stores, bank branches, whose gleaming plate glass windows are quite different from the small, very um, hodgepodge kinds of cell phone stores and music stores and clothing stores that rained on Fulton Mall and made some people feel very comfortable there. And this summer, uh, there is a new initiative on Fulton Mall, uh, a set of artisanal shops that are operating out of packing containers. Oh, that sounds, that sounds pretty cool. I think it's called Willoughby Market, something like that. Or, and at night, they, they open and call it Brooklyn Bazaar. And you say, wow, this is you know, this is pretty neat, this sounds nice. 
uh, let's go and, and see what they have and you know, see who is selling and designing and, and uh, kind of uh, creating new public space there. All of that might be interesting, but an entirely new group of people is replacing the people who felt comfortable there earlier, but don't feel comfortable there now. Interestingly, um, a senior seminar that I taught at Brooklyn College a few years ago did research on the redevelopment at Fulton Mall when the old Fulton Mall was still in business. And the students made up a little questionnaire about where people shopped. They stood <laughs> in four locations. One in front of the Lids hat store, hat and cap store, in the middle of Fulton Mall. Another location at the Metro Tech end of Fulton Mall, where there are a lot of financial offices. A third location on Montague Street, the shopping street of Brooklyn Heights, uh, an upper middle class <laughs> residential neighborhood. And a fourth location in Cobble Hill, a gentrified residential neighborhood near Brooklyn Heights. And by and large, the white people who answered my students' questionnaire said they never go to Fulton Mall. And when they were asked why they don't go to Fulton Mall, they said something very interesting. They did not say, well, there are no white people at Fulton Mall. And they didn't even say, oh, everything that's for sale at Fulton Mall is cheap, and I don't want to buy cheap stuff. Uh, they did not use the word ghetto. They did not say it's a ghetto space, which I actually had hypothesized, but nobody said that. What they said was, I don't go to Fulton Mall because there's nothing there for me. A lot of people spontaneously just use that expression. There's nothing there for me. And you know, it was true, right? It was true. As consumers, there was nothing there for them. Aesthetically, also. There was nothing there for them. It was a blank space for them in the city, a blank space, because socially, they didn't feel comfortable there. They would not have felt comfortable there. So I thought, this is really an incredible social discovery that people use this aesthetic judgment. There's nothing there for me when they really want to say, I don't feel comfortable with the kinds of people who are there. And then I started thinking about the history of Fulton Mall. There's a very nice little book about Fulton Mall by Rostin Wu and, and Meredith Ten Hoor called Street Value. But I actually know more about, about the history of Fulton Mall through my students' research uh, since, and my own research uh, from, from earlier days. Since about the 1960s, uh, the white middle class of Brooklyn left for the suburbs. They left to live in the suburbs. They left to shop in the suburbs. They were replaced by poorer people and a lot of people from the Caribbean and eventually people from many other regions of the world. And the business people on Fulton Mall found it hard at first to adjust to the change in population. The city government, the public officials, never adjusted to the change. And from the 1960s on, they were having discussions among themselves about what to do with Fulton Mall, because Fulton Mall, they said, was so degraded. They did not speak in racial terms. They spoke in social class terms. But they said, what can we do with Fulton Mall in the 1980s? There were a number of articles in the local media that talked about Fulton Mall's schlock shops, wig stores, nail salons, all of which were kind of code words for people not like us, people who were not middle class, and again, often people of color. So uh, these public officials were thinking, what can we do about Fulton Mall for a very long time? the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s, and public-private partnerships, merchants' associations came and went. 
And still, the stores that were selling those bargain products and the people who were comfortable on Fulton Mall were there. Nobody could, could take the place away from them. At the same time, all of the brownstone areas around Fulton Mall gradually became gentrified. The population of those neighborhoods whitened, and the city government officials were still saying, what can we do about Fulton Mall? Because they, like my students who did the survey on the street, they knew that the middle class and the white residents of nearby neighborhoods were not coming to this area, which could be, once again, as it was in the early 20th century, a major shopping attraction for many more people. So eventually, the city government got the idea of putting pressure on um, uh, the, the business uh, district of Fulton Mall by rezoning the streets around it, rezoning at first for new high-rise office buildings. And then the question became, how could the developers of these buildings ever rent out the space, the office space, if there were only cheap stores and a whole lot of low-income people shopping on Fulton Mall? Was as, on, as people discovered on 125th Street in Harlem, you can only rent those offices if you have nice restaurants and nice stores for nice people who work in those offices to shop at and eat at. So uh, in order not to talk, to, do, to talk about race, the city government officials said, we've got to get some better stores in there. And they thought that the, the magic store that would bring everyone together and make everyone feel comfortable in the public space would be can you guess what kind, what store? Low prices, everybody shops there. Target. I hear Kmart, I hear Target, no, no. H&M. They said H&M, if only we could get an H&M on Fulton Mall. So there isn't an H&M yet, but I would not be surprised if we see one in the near future. But the, you know, the idea is that you can, you can use a pitchfork and push people out of a public space because others who count more don't feel comfortable there. In fact, of course, office de building developers decided they did not want to take the risk of building all new office buildings near Fulton Mall, but what you have now is new residential buildings and some residential conversions of loft buildings and old office buildings near Fulton Mall. But the point is the same. You change the residents of the surrounding community and you've got to make a public space where they feel comfortable. But the comfort of one group means the discomfort sometimes of another group. Let's go back to that phrase, uh, there's nothing there for me. That brings me to the cultural dimension of comfort. There's nothing there for me is a kind of aesthetic judgment. Maybe it's not the same sort of thing you would say about a, a painting or a sculpture that you would see in a museum. But uh, it's something that you would say about an urban space. And it reminds me of what many people also say about urban spaces <coughs> to indicate their desirability or lack of desirability. What do people say when they talk about a street that they feel comfortable on? Not a residential street, but a mixed-use street with a lot of stores and, and restaurants. A, a kind of street often that doesn't look like Fulton Mall. Maybe it looks like Orchard Street now in contrast to Orchard Street 20 years ago or 30 years ago. Orchard Street now has, out of about 100 storefronts, seven art galleries and a whole lot of restaurants and cafes. So what do, what do people say about Orchard Street now that they would not have said 30 years ago? What do people say about Fulton Mall uh, when there's a, uh, a whole lot of artisanal stuff being sold out of packing containers, shipping containers? Uh, which they would not have said five years ago 
what, what words do they use? Think about yourself. What would you say if you were recommending that somebody go down to the Lower East Side? What word would, would, you, what word would you use? What would you say, it's, hmm? Where's that? It's what? Gritty. Cool. What else would you say? These are, these are all good words that people use. What else would you say? It's, do you ever say it's what? Bohemian, oh, I, that word takes me back. <laughs> do you ever say it's interesting? Have you ever heard people say, maybe it's my generation uses this word, uh, people say it's interesting there. And really what they mean by this aesthetic judgment is social comfort. Yeah, you know, there are the kinds of people there, the kinds of stores there, the kinds of cafes there that I feel comfortable with. Um, it's not Dunkin' Donuts, it's, well then depending on your uh, persuasion, it's Starbucks or it's, uh, you know, some little cafe where there's a barista and nobody even knows the name of this place but the coffee is really good. Uh, and people say, it's interesting there, like we're tourists. And we're, you know, we're going to this neighborhood street to consume what they have there and we don't want to be bothered by the people who don't belong there because they don't share our tastes. So I come back to that combination of aesthetic judgment and social feeling that we get when we hear the word comfort. But what is our comfort level in cities? Aren't cities, by definition, diverse? One of the very few things that I have um, picked up from the old Chicago school of urban sociologists, whom you probably still read in Sociology 101, is uh, that the definition of a city is size, density, and heterogeneity. And they meant heterogeneity to be a kind of economic diversity where everybody fulfills a different economic function and does a different kind of work, but everything beautifully works together, kind of like Jane Jacobs picked up on many years later. Uh, but I think that the basic definition of a city is ethnic diversity and social diversity. It's a diversity of people from all different points of view. And you know what? That diversity is going to peak the comfort level of some people. It might be us, it might be them, it might be somebody else. But one lesson of this lab, I'm sure, is that we have to make our comfort level conform to diversity. And we have to make sure that everyone's comfort level includes diversity so that we're not saying something is interesting only because it's comfortable for us. But that brings me back to private space and uh, thinking about how so many people who rent or buy apartments in those new luxury buildings that we see going up in certain places in New York today they never have to come out into public space to do whatever they want to do. They can stay in their apartment and call Fresh Direct. They don't even have to step into Whole Foods. They can just get their food delivered right to their kitchen by Fresh Direct. Uh, they, can, they don't have to go to the public swimming pool. Do you know, it, it, you can even join the public parks department swimming pools now. Um, and it, you know, it's not as expensive as joining a gym, but it does cost, does cost money. But these people who live in luxurious private space, newly built private space, they can go to a pool in their own building. They don't have to go outside to swim. And in fact, I was looking at this advertisement in tomorrow's New York Times Magazine uh, for a building called the Old Inn, uh, which is, uh, I think, in that area, Riverside, so uh, Riverside South, 
along the Hudson River around uh, the 70s, where Donald Trump's buildings are. And you know, it's a photograph in this advertisement of two teenagers in a bowling alley. But the bowling alley is not the kind of bowling alley you'd find in a neighborhood where you pay money to go in and play. It's a bowling alley in this new building. And the advertisement says, explore a whole new lifestyle at the Alden or Alden. The Alden offers everything you want and more. Exquisitely crafted residences, expensive park and river views, and 40,000 square feet of spectacular amenities. I'm sure they have a pool, but they also have a bowling alley. So what does that do to the privately owned public space of real bowling alleys, neighborhood bowling alleys, where you actually have a chance to bowl alongside other people who are not like you? I guess you're not supposed to um, abrade your comfort level by bowling in public. So what kind of aesthetic judgment do people make about that kind of bowling alley inside your very own apartment house? Do they call it interesting? Do they call it comfortable because you don't have to go out in public to, to bowl? Or do they call it intriguing? And this is the last thought I want to leave you with. Another advertisement, also in tomorrow's magazine section of the Times, has the headline, Intriguing, and a photograph of a gorgeous, serene pavilion located in Thailand, which is uh, being offered by Sotheby's Realty. And underneath the headline, Intriguing, the advertisement says, some homes arouse curiosity. A sense of wonder overcomes one to know what lies beyond lit doors and windows. It captivates with its fascinating and compelling qualities and draws you into a world that is at once vibrant and comforting. Vibrant and comforting. Isn't this what a city is supposed to be? That's the thought I want to leave you with. Thanks.